Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome back to another episode of The Dean Show. And today we're going to have in the studio Dr. Lawrence Brown. He's an amazing individual. His story is at thedeanshow.com with several other episodes that we've done with him. He, in short, was an atheist, someone who didn't believe in God, which is evident. I mean, design indicates a designer, something that's logical, rational. We didn't make ourselves, create ourselves. Someone created us, and it's the one God. From there, he went to being, or trying very hard to be a Christian, to being a Muslim, the same way Jesus, Abraham, Noah, they were all Muslims. They submitted themselves to the one God. This is what a Muslim is. But it took something very, very special inside a person that needs to come out, sincerity. And that's what we're going to revisit today, his story, and we're going to try to find out what was it. What was it that really led him finally to making that step of sincerity to accepting, look, that I don't have answers to all the questions. I'm going to take a break from all the baseball and the football games. I'm going to put the beer down, the Jack and Coke, and I'm going to stop visiting the nightclubs, and I'm going to stop just chasing the money and living from Friday to Friday, paycheck to paycheck, and I'm going to inquire and really want to find out what's the purpose of life. I don't have answers to all these questions. Where am I going when I die? And what have, had him take the extra leap to step forward and accept the way of life that brings you peace, happiness, contentment in this life and paradise in the next? We'll be back with Dr. Lawrence Brown. Don't go nowhere. So the world already knows. They've seen him on the Dean Show before. He's here with me. Take a good look. He's back in the Dean Show studio. Dr. Lawrence Brown. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam. Peace be with you, my brother. Dr. And to you. So, all right. People already know who you are. They've been watching the Dean Show. You have your own private section. We've done so many other shows before. And, you know, the first show that we did was about your conversion story. And people really enjoyed it. We got so many emails, so much positive feedback, and we, we want to continue on because there were some questions that arose from this program, and people were digging. They wanted to really know, you know more of the insights. What actually had you take that, that extra step? Because many people, you know, everything when it's explained to them, the tenets of faith, the oneness of God, day of judgment, accountability, original goodness, not original sin, everything in Islam makes sense. It brings you, you know, peace, happiness, but sometimes all this evidence you know, people see it, but they don't accept it because they have other things on their mind. Maybe they're not sincere with themselves and their creator. But it seems like you were. You're here. What happened? Talk to us. Um, well, I think it's a good question. And, and I think basically what you're, what you're saying is what made me take the step. Okay, we all know what put me on the religious search. Uh, anybody who has seen my conversion story knows that I was on a religious search, but how did that end in Islam? And uh, I, actually, I trace it all back to the prayer that I prayed when, uh, when my daughter was in the intensive care unit. Uh, you know, in brief, just to kind of recap, anybody who wants to look back on my conversion story, it all started when my daughter was born with a, uh, a, a lethal uh, defect in, in the uh, aorta, the major vessel that comes off of the heart. And uh, that led me to, to pray a prayer. And I remember to this day that what I prayed was, I was atheist at the time, so I didn't even know if God was there. So I prayed sort of a typical prayer for an atheist. I said, oh God, if you are there. I said, I don't know if you're there or not, but if you are there, I need help. And I remember that in that prayer, I promised God that if he would save my daughter and then guide me to the religion that was most pleasing to him that I would follow. And I think that, to me, is the key because, uh, you know, after, he saved, after, uh, after uh, our creator saved my daughter, I realized I had made a promise that put me upon my religious search. Uh, you've introduced me many times by saying that I was trying hard to become a Christian. Why was I trying to, so hard to become a Christian? Because I was trying to fulfill my promise to God. I had promised that if he guided me that I would follow. And growing up in America, I just naturally assumed I would find the answer somewhere in Christianity. And I kept going from congregation to congregation to congregation. Um, 
I know I've described to you, I don't know if I've described to the viewers, I mean, I attended Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, um, you know, my head kind of, Southern Baptist, my head kind of swims with the, you know, the different congregations I went to looking for the truth, and I always went through the same uh, scenario where I would, you know, I would ask the, uh, the priests or the ministers or the pastors, I would ask them questions that in the end they would never answer. I would say, well, you say Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Jesus Christ called himself the Son of Man. He called himself the Son of Man. Why do you call him the Son of God? And we would get into it. And I'd say, okay, you believe in the Trinity, which is nowhere in the Bible, and the evidence you used to hold up the Trinity was written by a scribe, but it's not in the scripture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we would get into it. You know, going through all the different doctrines of Christianity in the same way that we have addressed them in other episodes of The Dean Show, and I never got any satisfying answers, which pushed me on. You know, that's, that's when I'd say, well, thank you, you know, thanks anyway, and I'd move on. And it wasn't until I learned about Islam that all of the pieces fit in place. Islam is the only religion that answered all of my questions. It was only when I learned about Islam that, that my heart and my mind opened to Islam as the religion of truth. But the key to that is this. The key to that is I used to think I was really intelligent. I used to think, wow, I cracked the code. I figured it out where other people haven't, you know. I mean, but I, 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 would, I would, you know, I would attribute it to myself. You know, some years later, I had, a, I had a patient, a woman, who called me telling me she wanted to become Muslim. I don't know why. She was panicking when she called me. A couple days later, she came into my clinic with a newborn baby who was full of tubes, oxygen in his nose, Heplock, uh, feeding tube, a variety. I mean, this baby, this baby was, you know, in very bad condition, but barely doing well enough to have at least been discharged from the hospital. And I realized that this was the woman who had called me a couple of days before, saying she wanted to become Muslim. She knew I was Muslim, and and I was known in that area, and she she had called me. But when she came in. Uh, I, you know, I examined her baby, and the story came out. The story came out that her baby was born with what was considered by the doctors to be a near lethal heart defect. And she called me when she was panicking, thinking her, her son was going to die. And then her son got better, and he stabilized. And they discharged him from the hospital with all these tubes, but discharged from the hospital. And I asked her, I said, well, you know, weren't you the one who called me wanting to become Muslim? And she said, yes. And I said, so do you still want it? And she said, no, no, I don't need it now. I don't need it now, she said. She said, I don't need it now. See, he's gotten better. My son's gotten better, so I don't need it now. Oh, you want to, okay. Okay, now I look back on this situation and I, I think, okay, you know, she had a child that was on death's door. I had a child on death's door. She prayed to God for God to save that child. I prayed to God to save my child. We both made promises to God, okay? Why did God put me up on the path of the religion of truth and keep me on that path? And why did God not put her on the same path? Can it be sincerity now? My, yeah, I mean, my point is it comes down to sincerity. Sure, that's a big part of it. But the main thing is that we just have to recognize that God guides who he wills and he leaves to stray who he wills. It's not about intellect. It's not about intellect. It's about inspiration. It's about illumination. And if we start to think that we are the ones, that we are the ones responsible for putting ourselves on this path, that we figured it out with our intellect, then we are giving credit in the wrong direction because the credit really is to God. To, to God. Thank God for having guided us, having made us Muslim, put us on this path and kept us on this path because he could just as easily have given this to the other person yeah. and taken it from us. Yes, and when we say God, notice we're talking about the God of Jesus, Abraham, Noah, the God who created Jesus, the God who Jesus prayed to, that's God. Because you see people say God and they say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Or, you know, they'll, 
right. you know, praise the creation of God. When we say God, we're right. talking about the one God. Put it in terms that everybody can understand. We're talking about the creator, the creator of the universe and everything in it. Simple. So the one true God. One true God. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with more of this wonderful story with Dr. Lawrence Brown. Back here on The Dean Show with Dr. Lawrence Brown, Ph.D. in Religious Studies, D.D. Doctor in Divinity, and you are a doctor by profession. Yeah. yeah you, um, some consider you a Christian scholar, and we've done many shows with you in the past, but the one that really took off was your conversion story, and we're continuing on. Mm -hmm. We want to, people want to know more details about this. I want to take it back for a minute. Now, I remember in your story, when we first met, you said that if you wanted money, as an atheist now, you were self-independent. You felt like, okay, if I wanted money, I worked harder. You said if you wanted this, you got that. If you wanted that, you got that. You know, you, whatever it was material, you fixed it. If something was broke, you fixed it. But this is a key point that now many atheists, we know that this is a small minority, but you were one of them, and that at that moment when your, your, your child, your baby, was sick almost at the verge of death, it was out of your hands. Mm -hmm. can, can you comment on this? Was this a turning point? You said that you felt like you couldn't do it, you were helpless. Well, it's exactly as you said. Uh, you know, before, before Islam, before religion, uh, if I ever needed anything, I worked for it. And um, that was the first time in my life that I felt helpless and I needed help. And that's why I turned to God. There's this old saying that there are no atheists in a foxhole. You know, there are no atheists on a battlefield when, you know, the artillery shells are coming down and the bullets are whizzing by. <laughs> I guarantee you, everybody gets religion. But yeah. uh, <clears throat> you also made a point, just uh, and add to this, that many of us have become dependent. Healthcare, Medicare, you know. Yeah. Can you Remember how I was talking about this woman saying, I don't need it now. Yeah. I don't need God now. The child has gotten better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a common feeling among people that their lives are taken care of. Yes. From the cradle to the grave. I mean, you've got health insurance, you've got car insurance, you've got house insurance, you've got disability insurance. Uh, if you fall and break a leg in the store, you're going to sue the store and their insurance will cover them and that will pay you and on and on and on. And so we live in a society where people feel that their insurance is with man-made institutions, which will cover them for almost any eventuality. But it's when you face the eventualities that can't be insured, you know. Uh, you can have health insurance to pay for your illness, but do you really want to be ill in the first place? Okay, you can have life insurance that will pay somebody after you die, but that's not going to help you once you're dead. So, you know, you come to critical points where you, where you realize that you need God. Um, isn't it far better to recognize that we need God in, in all things? In all things. In all things. Yeah. Uh, you, you, can, you can trust your human construct of insurance, or you can trust the Creator. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. But this is the difference between those who put their trust in the worldly uh, you know, institutions and those, those who put their trust in the divine. Now, let's move it back, moving forward. Now, we, we're talking about sincerity. You know, people, they have it in themselves to be sincere. If somebody really sincerely wants some drugs, you know, they'll go out there and they'll hustle and bustle to get those drugs. And they'll be sincere about it. You know, they'll cry for it. The, the girl who wants something from her parents, you know, young lady, older lady, you know, she won't get her way with her husband or her boyfriend, whatever the case, and she'll sincerely shed tears to get what she wants. Same thing with the man who wants to get in, let's say, the nightclub. He'll sincerely sweat the door, man, give him some money <laughs> to get into the club. But how about yeah. that sincerity of wanting guidance, wanting to know the purpose of life, and who best to tell us than the one who created life? How does a person get that sincerity? Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I think I would say is I, I don't completely agree with what you just said about sincerity. Uh -huh. People do a lot of things to get what they want, but afterwards, when they look themselves in their mirror, in their, in their mind's eye, you know, not necessarily looking in the mirror in the literal sense, but when they realize that they just did something, you know, pretty immoral or pretty low down or pretty mm. dishonest or whatever to get what they want, 
they'll justify it. I mean, they'll say, I really needed it. I really wanted it. But at the same time, they'll have a little bit of a low opinion of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, man, did I really have to get it that way? You know, did I really have to lie? Did I really have to cheat? Did I really have to steal? Did I really have to be immoral? Did I really have to this, that, the, the other thing? You know, a lot, of, a lot of times people compromise their values to get what they want. But you can't do that with God because God knows what's in your heart and he knows if you're being sincere or not. You can't play these games with the Creator. Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't play these games. I mean, I remember once talking to a Christian and I said, do you really believe? Do you really believe in your religion? And he said, no. He said, I don't believe any part of it. But I have been baptized, so when I die, you know, I'll have that to fall back on. You know, as if somehow that's going to save him. He doesn't believe anything. He doesn't follow anything. He's not leading a righteous life. But he believes that simply because he was baptized, well, he can fall back on that, as if mm -hmm. that's going to save him. Yes. So, you know, we, we know from the Bible, faith without works is dead. Faith and works is the formula, okay? But in addition to faith, in addition to works, you have to have sincerity. Yes, sincerity. Now, you mentioned a story, we, we know your story, and you made a promise to the Creator, you know, He showed you His sign, and we know that, okay, every individual, they might have some personal things, experiences that happen to them, but we have the ultimate proof, the verbatim Word of God, which is a living miracle, science, history, prophecies, everything in there, facts, not fiction, that a person right. can really take an analytical, a scientific approach to come to the conclusion, as 1.5 billion people have come to, that there's no way that this Qur'an could come from other than the Creator of the heavens and earth. But now tell us, you were sincere and you followed up what you stated to the creator what was in your heart you followed up with action this lady she got her prayer answered god saved her child but then she backed away isn't there something in the verbatim word of god and you comment on this where god almighty is saying that look when they call upon him alone they drop the son in the holy ghost so they they don't go to krishna or, or this calf god or the baby god you know they go to the one god and he answers them, and then they go back yeah. to, to worshiping other gods besides God. Sure. And, uh, it, and they go back to their ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, this is well known. And there's one, the, the story that leaps to my mind is the story in the, uh, in the Holy Quran, which describes the sailors in the ship on the sea that is getting tossed around in a storm. They think they're going to drown. They all profess true faith. But then when they reach the land, they go back. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, I know a real life story like this. Tell us this, tell us this, please. A, please. A, man, a brother, a Muslim working in the merchant marine, okay? He's working in the merchant marine on, on this ocean going vessel. There were something like 20 some people who, uh, they were just constantly making fun of him, you know? Him stopping in his day to make his daily prayers, his dietary restrictions, didn't join in with them with the, with the drinking and this, that, or the other thing. Constantly making fun of him, making his life miserable. Until they got in just this horrendous storm and the ship became crippled and everybody believed it was going to go down and that they were going to drown. And literally every single person on that ship came to that Muslim brother and made shahada. And he, I mean, he testified, he said every single person on that ship came and testified and became Muslim. Now when you say this testament, and, yeah. And when they were saved and when the ship just kind of limped into port and everybody got off of the ship, every single one of them went back. Wow, so at the heat when... So, so I mean, it's just fulfillment of the Quranic story. Yeah. How, how some, some people, you know, when the pressure is the, upon them, it's, oh, God saved me, God saved me, God saved me. What? I'm saved? Oh, uh, thanks. Um, right. You know, and they just, uh, you know, they just go back what, to what uh, they were upon before. When you're in the air and the turbulence And they may not even say thanks. Yeah. It may just be, oh, well, it was just a storm. Yeah. It was just, I would have been saved anyway. Uh, you know, this sort of thing. So, yeah, so when the turbulent hits, when the waves are high, shaking in the boat, and you feel your life's about to end, you turn to God. Yeah. But this goes back to you not being sincere then. And, the, you know, I face this myself. 
Yeah. I mean, when, when my daughter reversed, when my daughter reversed without medicine, without surgery, with no treatment, and became a perfectly normal child, the doctors had an explanation. Okay? And that sufficed for them. It didn't suffice for me because I knew the prayer that I had prayed and I, I knew with a certainty that this was the hand of God in the healing of my child. But that was what was in my heart. Where did I get that feeling from? From myself? No, I, that's from God. Mm -hmm. You know, There's a famous, famous story of a scholar who was traveling and in his travels he, uh, he, he went to sleep and when he woke up there was a cloud and this cloud had a light and the light spoke to him and told him that because of his great scholarship, because of his great piety, he, God, was releasing this man from the obligation of prayer. Mm -hmm. And this scholar didn't even need to think about it. He just said to the cloud, said, oh cursed shaitan, you are trying to mislead me, you are trying to misguide me. You know, because God did not even release the prophets from prayer, and who is more righteous than them? Yeah, so, you, so when he acknowledged the, the cloud as what it really was, a trick, of, a trick of the Satan trying to misguide him, the cloud, the cloud acknowledged that it was the Satan, said, yes, you are right, this is the Satan. Know that only your intelligence has saved you. What did he say? He said, O cursed Satan, O cursed Satan, it is not my intelligence that has saved me. You know, the only thing that saves me is God. Now, how many of us would have said, would have said, yeah, yeah, you're right, man, I figured it out. I figured out that you're the Satan. So, yeah, it's, it's my intelligence that saved me. No, the Satan doesn't give up. He tries to get you to disbelieve, and if he can't get you to disbelieve, he will try to get to trip you up in other ways. Yeah. So, you know, when he couldn't get him to disbelieve, he tried to get him to believing that it was his intelligence. But being a true scholar, you know, he said, no, it's only God that is saving me. It's all and what did the Satan say? He said, he said that he cannot touch him, but that he had misguided 70 scholars by this way before him. Wow. Scholars, not laity, scholars. It's a big lesson to us. No matter how high you get in the chain of religious knowledge, you can still become misguided. And we got to be careful. We'll be right back with more here on The Dean Show. Back here on The Dean Show with Dr. Lawrence Brown, continuing on. Yes, not only do we have to be careful, we have to be extra, extra careful because the devil, Shaitan, is always working to mislead us. This is something that's detrimental to our success, not only in this life, but definitely in the next. Tell us now, in, in the last few minutes that we have, I mean, you know, we know that faith goes up and down. Sometimes we're on oh, level yeah. 10, sometimes on level 5. And also, you know, some people, they, they do sincerely, you know, they pray to God, and then God delivers the guidance, the help, but now distraction. Did you ever get distracted, you know, men with the women, women with the men, money? So what advice do you have for these situations that occur? Distractions? and the level of faith going down, and then you go back and revert to old ways, old bad habits. Did I ever get distracted? Uh, no, I've been perfect from day one. Uh, <clears throat> no, nothing. <laughs> of course, I'm being extremely sarcastic. Uh, no, it's, it's as you said, all of us, our faith waxes and wanes at different levels. And uh, I think you just have to constantly remind yourself who is the source of all things in this life. Uh, you have to constantly return to the, to the Shahada, the Shahada being the testimony of faith. You know, the Shahada is very simple. We are testifying to the belief in God as one God. The only one worthy of worship is Allah, our Creator, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was his final prophet. And when, when, you're, when your belief you know, sort of uh, becomes weakened when things come at you to uh, fill you with doubt. In my experience, all you have to do is go back to the Shahada and just say to myself, wait a minute, uh, these things might be knocking me down a little bit, but the Shahada, God is one God, Muhammad is the prophet, yeah, you know what, I still believe that, and that's what I'm going to hold on to. 
And as soon as, you know, every time you restate the shahada, even if you say it out loud, but just to yourself, it just, it raises your iman, it raises your, you know, level of uh, belief. And uh, so I, I feel that's the greatest tool. That's the heaviest, isn't it? It's one of them. I yeah. mean, Awadu Billahi Mina Shaitan Rajim to seek refuge from the Shaitan. Um, refuge, you know, with Allah from the Shaitan. Um, and uh, then just, just to remember what you are standing upon. Yeah. And that's the Shahada. And that, that has always been sufficient for me. But does our Iman wax and wane? Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Being around righteous people, does this help you people when you're down that help encourage you and lift your spirits back oh, up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as you can, hang around people who are not only righteous, but who want good for you. Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who, who don't necessarily want good for you. Maybe they're jealous of you. Maybe they feel threatened by you. Yeah. Who knows? But what, yeah. what, What's really helped me, and we're almost out of time, is the prayer, the connection with the Creator. Many Muslims, they slack on this and really establishing and getting grounded with that connection minimum five times a day. Yeah, absolutely. Has this really helped you? And another thing is increasing the prayers because there's a saying that if you leave the Sunnah, you will leave the Fard. Uh -huh. You know, if all you do is you pray the minimum number of prayers and you don't ever pray any uh, extra prayers, if you're only praying the minimum number of prayers, you don't have anything to slack off on. Yeah. And if your iman gets hit for a blow and you just kind of feel like not doing as much as you used to do, that's when you lose, lose the fard prayer. Yeah. But if you are in the practice of making your sunnah prayers, your, your extra non-obligatory prayers, and something comes along to just kind of uh, lower your sense of belief or lower your, your zeal for the practice of the religion, you can leave the sunnah prayers without compromising the obligatory prayers and you will keep your religion intact. Yes. So it, it's nice to sort of buffer yourself, sort of make a safety zone yeah. by doing, by practicing on a normal basis more than what you have to. It's like extra cardio here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for our not yet Muslim brothers in humanity who are watching maybe for the first time, and many of them, I get many emails and they like what we have to say. The message is simple. Worship the one God alone and not his creation. Do the good that he wants you to do because that's a manifestation of your belief. Talk is cheap. Do righteous actions. Develop yourself to be the best human being that you can be. They are sincerely, a lot of them, you know, they're attentively listening. What advice do you have from them? Because you've been there and you've done that. And then also how people can get a hold of you if they need to read some of your books and maybe have a nice dialogue with you. You know, I was just talking with a man the other day who was asking me, how can I know for sure? You know, basically, uh, you know, he had been raised upon Catholicism, he liked everything I was saying, but he didn't trust himself to make the decision. And I said, don't, don't make the decision. Go back to your Creator, pray to your Creator and leave the decision with Him, okay? You've got your job, you have to study, you have to investigate, you have to, to the best of your ability, find out what, what the truth is, but in the end, there's nothing that replaces the power of the Creator, so pray to God. Ask Him to put the truth into your heart and into your mind, to show you the direction, to make you sincere and truthful, and to put you upon the right path. And then, when you feel the certainty enter your heart, when you feel the certainty enter your mind, that is when you follow the direction you feel Allah or our Creator has given you. Thank you very much. May God Almighty Allah reward you for being with us. And, and you. And to get in contact with Dr. Brown, some of his books, to look him up, he's at leveltruth.com. If you want to contact him, press the contact button and you'll have uh, access to him. And thank you again for tuning in to The Dean Show. We're here to help you understand what it's all about, purpose of life, why you're here, why you've been created, all these very important topics. Because at the end of the day, the party will end, we will all die, and we're going to be accountable for everything we did in this life. So we better get with it now before it's too late. So I hope you like, I hope you like what we had to say. If you'd like a free copy of the Rebating Word of God, or if you have some more questions, call the number on the screen, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Until next time, peace be unto you.